welcome back. Uh, we were continuing, we will continue our discussion with photolithography. Uh, we talked about uh, essentially we talked about the mask and we are we will start our discussion today from the different exposure modes. But before that uh, we have this uh, sort of a cartoon or an animation of the photolithography process which will allow us to sort of revise the whole process and also let us track up to what extent we have uh, reached in our uh, discussion. So, uh, this is how it goes you see the p type silicon wafer you grow the oxide layer which you all understand now you do uh, grow the photo resist. So, that is by spin coating then of course, uh, you bring in the mask place the mask do the UVO exposure. So, as you do the UVO exposure there is change in property in the photo resist layer this is hardening. So, therefore, it is a negative photo resist now you can conclude that then you sort of introduce the developer which is mentioned as thinner in this. So, what happens now is the photo resist layer now goes away. Uh, so, we have roughly talked about this level not in details, but we will talk and what what is the next thing to do next thing to do would be to in fact remove the oxide layer along the contours of the pattern photo resist layer and that is when you do the etching hydrofluoric acid is the simplest version uh, where which is the wet etching as you will understand. So, essentially what you see now is the pattern on the mask you first transferred on the photo resist layer and subsequently it has been transferred in the oxide layer and that is what you wanted to achieve because if you remember our initial discussion you eventually wanted to have a patterned oxide layer. So, that now when you place the uh, this uh, wafer with this uh, patterned barrier layer you can have uh, spatial domains of uh, uh, n type doping for example, but there is one small uh, issue here uh, it is very likely that the condition in the doping reaction dopant uh, chamber is going to be pretty hostile I mean it is high temperature high pressure process and the photo resist even the hardened part of the photo resist may not be able to withstand it. Therefore, before the it is uh, sort of uh, introduced to the dopant chamber the photo resist layer the pattern photo resist layer is also removed and this is very important. So, you create the photo resist layer by spin coating then you expose it under the uh, photo mask and then uh, what you have is a weaker part so called weaker part of the photo resist and the stronger part of the photo resist depending on uh, the nature of the tone of the photo resist you now know that there is going to be a difference, but the developer in fact removes the so called weaker part of the resist right but this uh, stronger or the hardened part hmm, is also removed at a later stage and we will see it is again some sort of a solution or there can be other processes. So, the entire photoresist layer is actually removed, but at different stages and during the different uh, in between these two stages you actually have an intermediate stage where you have a pattern photoresist layer and along that uh, at that stage in fact, you would like to do the etching. So, that you can transfer the pattern in the photo resist layer to the barrier layer. So, you see the pattern actually gets transferred from the mask to the photo resist layer with the help of UVO light because and that is where the uh, terminology photolithography comes in, but that does not serve your purpose from the standpoint of doping which is essential for microelectronics and for that you in fact need to do etching of the barrier layer along the contours of the uh, pattern photo resist layer and then you are ready to uh, go ahead once the photo resist layer is removed. So, you do the doping. So, you create the p n junctions, but then for your subsequent processing even the barrier layer is unimportant. So, you finally, need to even remove the barrier layer to get again a flat wafer back, but now the difference between the initial wafer you started off with and the final wafer is the initial wafer was fully p type doped and the final wafer has domains of p and in regions which act as the p n junctions. So, this is in a nutshell the whole process of photolithography and uh, we have sort of uh, discussed uh, up to this point you now know what is mask and uh, you are going to expose it to UVO, but there are certain additional issues which we are going to discuss now. 
So, this we discussed in detail in the previous class and I will just repeat it. So, you introduce the mask, expose and then you can create the structures. Well, uh, the way I have or we have discussed so far about the exposure part is apparently gives you a feeling that you bring in the photo mask, simply place it on top of the photo resist uh, film and expose it with the UV lamp. Well, that is indeed uh, possible to do and that is how initially the process started and this is what is known as contact printing. However, there are certain problems. Uh, firstly, that when you are placing the photo mask on the photo resist layer, there is a possibility that during the UV exposure, these portions of the photo resist when they uh, sort of undergo uh, structural uh, changes or changes in their property, there might be some debris formation and there might be some possibility of some uh, debris sticking to the mask. As you can already understand, the mask has to be made by some secondary fabrication technique and it is a pretty costly device. So, you do not want your mask to be damaged uh, after every exposure, you would like to sort of have uh, the uh, uh, mask to be reused for many, many exposure cycles. So, contact printing though it gives uh, the best uh, resolution and it is easiest to execute, but contact printing has the the severe problem of mask damage and therefore, industrially it is not uh, very well uh, utilized anymore. Of course, in the research level you can always do contact printing. Uh, what one does is to uh, avoid the possibility of mask damage is bring the uh, mask very close to the uh, photo resist layer, but do not bring it in full contact. So, you have some sort of a placing arrangement and please understand we talked about this mask aligner. So, you typically do not uh, use your hand to uh, keep the mask on the photo resist layer and uh, do the exposure. So, there is instrumental device, uh, instrumentation is available, it is heavily instrumented, uh, it is a heavy piece of instrument in fact, big instrument. So, what you do? You bring in the mask in very close proximity, but you do not really touch it and this is known as proximity printing. There is a little loss of resolution of course, because it is not in perfect contact due to edge diffraction and stuff like that but it eliminates completely the possibility of uh, uh, your uh, mask damage and things like that. Once this was uh, developed, it was also discovered that you can in principle have uh, a situation where the mask is not in full uh, uh, prox uh, conformal contact with the photo resist layer and you can still have a development. And if that is doable, then what was immediately thought about why do not, why not introduce a, another lens in this pathway. So, increase the gap, introduce another lens which can further lead to additional reduction and what will be the advantage? So, you appropriately place the uh, photo resist layer at the focal plane. What is the advantage? Advantage is, uh, so th these are contact printing and proximity printing. So, these are some of the details with how, so this particular table. Again, please do not uh, try to remember these numbers, these are for your understanding, you will have this PPT uh, in your as your resource. So, you see that as the gap increases, the resolution, the minimum resolution sort of also increases. So, there is a bit of loss of resolution uh, with increase in gap. As the gap increases. Okay. Uh, but then the projection printing uh, as I told that you introduce another extra optical lens which, which will reduce the dimensions and uh, this is sort of the industry standard. So, what is the biggest advantage? Biggest advantage is that you can in principle create smaller structures with a mask that has larger patterns because if you look back in your uh, contact aligner or in proximity proximity printing, the dimension of your uh, replicated structures is sort of identical to that of the mask. So, if you would like to create 200 nanometer uh, wide lines or structures, your mask must have 200 nanometer wide uh, structures. Of course, there are certain issues with the diffraction limitation of uh, um, uh, uh, photolithography that is simply because of the fact that the minimum wavelength of light that will pass through an opening depends on the lambda of the source itself. And as I told that uh, you typically use UV for exposure, 
initially one used 256 nanometer wavelength, but now its industry standard is 193 nanometer. Uh, there are issues. Uh, so, anyway resolution is sort of limited to about uh, 100 nanometer lambda by 2. Uh, that is not very good news, because and now you see we have already talked about this i 5 and i 7 core processors you have line width which is down to 20 nanometer. So, question to ask is how does people achieve this and uh, we will come up with some answer of this. These require a pretty detailed understanding of optics and therefore, I will try to avoid it not to go to details of that, but here uh, both in proximity printing as well as in contact printing uh, you understand that the size you get of the features is identical to the size of the mask patterns. But here is an advantage. So, if there is a reduction that is taking place, you can have bigger structures on the mask and you can create smaller patterns uh, on the photoresist layer. So, that is one of the advantages. Uh, so, when I say that you get structures like 30 nanometer and uh, the wavelength of the source is of the order of 200 nanometer and you also are aware of diffraction limitation, which is sort of the minimum resolution will be limited to lambda by 2. You always tend to worry, uh, how is it possible? How is it possible that uh, we have 200 nanometer the lambda by 2 limitation is in place and still you get something like 30 nanometer. So, here is one of the answers. What you do is you utilize uh, the possible reduction using another lens between the photo mask and the photoresist layer and that is what is known as projection printing. In fact, uh, this is sort of the industry standard with this a 5 x reduction lens and there is another term again a pedagogic term, but it is important at times to know. So, that you certain somebody talks to you about a reticle and you feel oh I know about mask and I do not know what is a reticle. That is not the case. Typically, the masks used in a projection printing mode are called the reticles and typically if one uh, talks that one is using a 5 x reticle, it means that it is a lens. You have a lens in the system, uh, which is achieving capable of achieving features, which are 5 times smaller in lateral dimension as compared to the structure on the mask surface. So, that is what exactly is a reticle in simple terms. In fact, uh, one of the thing that is important to understand is uh, wafer is a pretty large. So, you get 4 inch, 5, 6 inch or 8 inch wafers and you do not print one uh, circuit may be on that. You would like to create many circuits or many transistor circuits on them. So, what you do? If you look these two figures carefully, so you have a mask, this is the photo mask, this is the light source, uh, of course, you can now understand here is a lens. So, this is what you can straight away say that the printing mode is projection printing. And if it is a projection printing, you will not be calling it a mask anymore, you will be calling it a reticle. That is exactly what is written. You now realize the second advantage. So, what you do is you expose this part. So, this whole wafer is coated with the photoresist. You expose this part, other parts are not exposed. So, therefore, there is no proper change in property in the photoresist layer. And then once this part is exposed, it is now mounted on a stage in the mask aligner, which can be moved in both x and y direction, it is a mechanized stage. So, you can sort of uh, uh, shift it, right. So, once this is the, this area is uh, exposed, what you do? You simply shift it, what according to this cartoon, what has been there done? The photo, the, the uh, uh, wafer has been shifted in this particular direction and they, then again, this area just behind the location of the place where the first exposure took place is exposed again following the uh, reticle, uh, following the same exposure uh, optics. What is the advantage? Here unlike in contact mode or in proximity mode, the mask and the uh, photoresist coated wafer are not in direct contact and therefore, the mask aligner can easily shift it and move it. So, you can sort of uh, use the same mask with a single pattern uh, uh, to sort of expose 
various areas in multiple number of ways. So, this is one of the utilities. I mentioned that mask aligner is a very, very important piece of device, uh, important piece of instrument that is almost mandatory to have, because though the process looks simple, you do not uh, take your hand and uh, or fingers to place the mask on your thin film and do the exposure that you can do in your laboratory once or twice, but not in the industry. So, this is how it this printing modes work. Uh, the mask aligner you also the other major importance of the mask aligner apart from pr printing multiple number of circuits or patterns on the same wafer is that in many actual design of let us say a transistor or whatever uh, or, or whatever fabrication you would like to make, uh, you might have to do this deposition and patterning at several le levels and several layers. Uh, so, uh, for example, here you see that you have one of the pre existing patterns and then you would like to place these dots maybe for electrical contact or something like that exactly at their middle. So, you need to in fact know the existence or the location precise location of the patterns that has been created uh, which might have been developed which might not have been developed and been exposed in the previous uh, cycle I mean that is the that is the very very important thing. So, actual fabrication of a uh, architecture device architecture like this might require uh, 5 or uh, 6 steps of photolithography as is sort of shown in this uh, cartoon. So, it is a sort of one can argue this is multi step and as you try to do that what is extremely important that the second step onward all your deposition and patterns should be with respect to the pre existing patterns created by the first step or the previous step or the I, I minus first step and how do you identify that and that is the role of the mask aligner to place the mask for the i th step accurately with respect to the patterns that has been created in the i minus first step. So, that is the importance of a mask aligner and uh, there are typically these are uh, industrial details. So, there are markers on the mask aligner so that you can align it and things like that. So, suppose uh, this is this uh, is the uh, this uh, I will just draw it. So, this outer cross is sort of a marker for the mask aligner and the inner one is a mark that has been created in the previous stage. So, you would like to properly align and this is how it should be aligned, this is the correct alignment. So, if the alignment is like this, what do you understand? What you understand is the mask you are now placing is actually shifted in the left direction with respect to the correct the existing pattern. So, you need to you, you need to adjust the stage of the mask aligner, move it in the right direction, so that it goes back to this arrangement. Uh, if I now uh, tell you, uh, now you can understand what is happening. So, if you look at this geometry, you would immediate this uh, set of pic pictures, you will immediately now understand well the mask uh, has been placed a little lower as compared to the existing structure. So, what you need to do is you need to wind the screws and move the mask in this direction. Uh, these are interesting case studies. So, this is called run out, nothing to do with run out in cricket of course. Uh, how is this possible? Well, uh, you are using in fact projection mode uh, printing of course and therefore, this is possible when you have placed your mask or your substrate with respect to the mask at a wrong elevation. So, it is not focused, it is focusing at a different plane and you do not need to move either uh, the mask aligner stage either in the x and y, but you need to adjust it in the z direction right. I hope you are getting the point. So, this is like it is not focused and you move it up or down in the z direction and then you can achieve the alignment. Uh, rotationally misaligned what has happened is that this was the original pattern and the second mask when you brought in it is at a angle with respect to the existing pattern. So, you need to uh, again not uh, move either in x and y, but you sort of need to orient uh, change the orientational angle so that you are back to this configuration. So, this is sort of you it is a very easy way of guiding what are the possible misalignments and what the mask aligner can do. So, uh, photolithography I will just draw a quick analog photolithography is very similar to classical photography right. Of course, cla classical photography is now almost dead uh, thanks to the advent of the digital camera and uh, why because the photo resist coated wafer is analogous to the film. The mask aligner is and the stepper, the mask aligner primarily is sort of the camera and the mask or the reticle 
is essentially subject of the picture. So, you want to create an image on the film in a classical film based camera and here you want to cre create an image of your mask on the photoresist layer, uh, but photo uh, so, uh, so that, 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 that is it. Uh, now, of course, uh, one of the major development that is, uh, that, that is taking place and one of the major issues is how does one sort of try to match with the Moore's law, because feature sizes are going down and down. Uh, we already know that uh, industrially probably the latest computers that are coming, the chips or the processors have line width of around 20 nanometer. So, uh, question to ask is how does one achieve this, particularly considering this particular number, this lambda by 2, what is that? That is the diffraction limit in resolution. So, uh, one of the options of course, is to use uh, lower wavelength exposure light, right. So, you do not exactly use, uh, you use something like deep UV and essentially you tend towards x-ray, but that leads to two primary concerns. One of the concern is you need a synchrotronic light source to generate light with such small wavelength. That is one of the concern. Of course, synchrotronic light source is, is a very expensive proposition. It is not that easy to get. But there is a second and uh, uh, there is already huge investment that has taken place worldwide uh, utilizing this UVO based exposure system. So, you have to junk all of them if technology really goes in that direction. There was a time when people seriously believed that one needs to go for synchrotronic light source for achieving higher resolution, but it turned out to be very, very uh, almost impossible from the standpoint of the capital investment. There is another very important second aspect and that is the photoresist chemistry. Because what you need to understand that when this particularly the sensitizer part in the photoresist, which is the optically sensitive part of the photoresist is sort of synthesized or tuned to change its property at a particular wavelength. And presently the wavelength is matched with the wavelength of the exposure, uh, of the exposure illumination source that is being used. So, if one is using UVO at 193 nanometer all the photoresist are designed, so that they will change their property when they are exposed to 193 nanometer wavelength light. As I told you, one takes a UV sensitive photoresist uh, to ensure that the photoresist does not change its property to let us say the visible light that is present in the lab during working. That is important, because you cannot do the coating and all the processing steps in dark, right. So, now if you hypothetically think that you are going to use uh, light with much uh, reduced wavelength, you immediately need to understand that the present generation of set of photoresist, which again has sort of uh, taken place after huge amount of development and research in those area are all going to be junked off, because none of them will work. Suppose you take, you start uh, using light at a source of 50 nanometer wavelength, the present generation of photoresist will simply not undergo any change in their property at 50 nanometer wavelength. So, th these are severe concerns and therefore, people are simply trying to stretch photolithography, the classical photolithography in its present form to the maximum possible extent. W one of the approaches that is adopted and industrially practiced is of course, the projection lithography, which allows you to create structures that are five times smaller than the uh, patterns on the mask. So, even uh, if you have 193 nanometer wavelength light, which sort of gives you a resolution limitation of 100 nanometer, you can see that you can still go down to about 20, 25 nanometer, that is possible. But people are still working and one of the areas they have sort of uh, realized where they can bring in even further reduction is in fact, replacing air in this particular area with a high R i liquid, which of course, has to be transparent, because if it is not transparent, if it absorbs all the light, then it, uh, the wave, the light does not reach the uh, photoresist layer. That is not good news. So, uh, easiest uh, solution of course, is water. You do not want to introduce a solid, because why you do not want to introduce a solid, because then uh, movement of the mask aligner becomes difficult and there will be friction, you can't move it freely. So, uh, to cut it short, in fact, what is done is you introduce some water 
between the projection lens and the photoresist layer. What this water does, water has an Ri of uh, around 1.47, it increases the numerical aperture by uh, you just uh, have a look into what is numerical aperture, n is the refractive index and theta is the angle by which it refracts. So, there is an increase in the uh, numerical aperture and that increases the resolution by somewhat uh, about 30 to 40 percent and uh, even research wise down to 40 nanometers with immersion lithography is pretty easy in fact. So, what you have now, you have the projection printing mechanism and along with that you need to have a nozzle which will dispense water. So, that uh, there is a continuous water meniscus between the projection lens and the substrate and you would achieve uh, additional reduction uh, in the feature size due to higher Ri of water as compared to air. So, uh, I think, uh, so after uh, anyway we will just uh, wrap, it, wrap up this post exposure bake and then stop this class. So, post exposure bake is done at a temperature of 110 to 130 degrees centigrade, very short duration. It is after you have exposed to the UVO. So, of course, extremely important for immersion lithography because you have a moist photoresist layer coming out, but even otherwise if there are any debris or something like that, any solvent contamination or anything during the exposure, this PEB essentially removes that and uh, it also removes uh, the standing wave pattern, something that I did not discuss in greater detail, but if you are interested, you can just have a look what it is. Uh, one needs to be very careful not to over expose, uh, over post bake because this will lead to polymerization of the photoresist and therefore, removing the photoresist at the later stage is going to be difficult and, uh, and it is necessary essential for etching and uh, we will see what, what, what we discuss about lift off. So, uh, what we discussed in this class is about the printing modes and their utilities and uh, of course, we extended the discussion to immersion lithography and the final stages of photolithography we will discuss in the next class. Thank you.